Hello, hello. Let's start Unit 7, Topics 10 and 11. This is speciation and extinction. So speciation is how new species are made. Extinction is how new species go away. So let's talk. Species is a group of individual organisms <clears throat> that are able to interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. This is on your vocab sheet that I gave you the other day. Speciation is the formation of new species. It results in the diversity of life forms. And um, yeah, this is kind of how new species arise. You'll hear uh, news stories of new species found in the, the wilds of uh, the Brazilian rainforest, right? This is how it happens. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So geography has a huge impact on speciation and the emergence of new species. There's two modes of it, and they're both very fun to say. The first one is allopatric speciation, and the other one is sympatric speciation. We're going to take them two, uh, one at a time. Pause, oops, sorry, pause here to take notes. So we'll take them one at a time. Allopatric speciation is a physical barrier divides a population or a small population is separated from the main population. For example, a founder's effect. Populations are geographically isolated. So um, another, you know, there's a barrier that happens between them. Actually, one of the, the uh, a really good example of this is Victoria Falls in Africa. At one point, it was a huge lake. And then as um, the water started to evaporate and aridification started to occur, it got broken up into three separate lakes. So that a physical barrier between the populations existed and all three lakes then evolved and went through this allopatric speciation to become a whole new species. Really cool stuff. Um, the, it does prevent gene flow, right? So there's no gene flow going from one population of species to the next. And it's often caused by natural disasters, but there are other reasons for it as well. Sympatric speciation is when a new species evolves while still inhabiting the same geographic region as the ancestral species. Um, it's usually due to an exploitation of a new niche. So a new niche comes out, um, you know, we need a, a particular species to perform a particular job in our ecosystem. So uh, one species will kind of... Um, the, their genetics and adaptations will break off that allow them to fill that niche while the rest are behind. Um, yeah, great. Pause here to take notes. So here's how it is kind of, you know, visually. You can see on the left-hand side, allopatric speciation. There's that green oval in the original population. Right up, yeah. All right, same with the sympatric. Allopatric barrier is formed. Let's say, oh, I don't know, a giant landslide comes in and forms a physical barrier. In isolation, one, um, one side of the barrier will form uh, a new species out of reproductive isolation. So they're isolated by this barrier. They're only reproducing with each other. And after, uh, you know, maybe this barrier gets cleaned up, um, the new distinct species kind of intermingles now. Um, but they cannot mate. It's a new distinct species. Sympatric is essentially the same thing, but instead of a barrier forming, there's a, a mutation that occurs that allows for this little population right over here to start filling in the new niche. They mate with each other population becomes bigger and you can see that the new species that is distinct from the old is still within the total population. Pause here to take notes. Speciation occurs primarily due to reproductive isolation. I shouldn't say primarily. It occurs due to reproductive isolation. And there's two types of reproductive isolation. When I say reproductive isolation, I mean uh, a reason why one member of a species cannot mate and have fertile offspring with another member of that species. There's two types. There's prezygotic barriers 
and postzygotic barriers. Pause here to write those down. Oh, nope, just kidding. One more. Both types maintain this type of isolation and prevent gene flow between populations. Gene flow increases genetic diversity by increasing the depth and width of the gene pool in a species. These things uh, prevent that from happening. Pause here to take notes. <clears throat> all right, so let's talk prezygotic barriers. Uh, they prevent mating at all, or they hinder fertilization. So mating between uh, individuals can take place, but um, there's no fertilization that occurs. There's five types of it. We're going to go over each one individually. The first is habitat isolation. Next is temporal isolation. Third is behavioral isolation. Fourth is mechanical isolation. And finally, we have gametic isolation. Pause here to take notes. Great, so let's talk about habitat isolation first. So habitat isolation is literally species living in different areas. Okay, or they occupy different habitats within the same area, right? So they physically, so for example, North American mountain bluebirds live in high elevation, while Eastern bluebirds live at low elevation. Theoretically, these two individuals could mate and have viable offspring, but they never will because they live in different places. They're just never going to meet each other. How sad. Pause here to take notes. Next up, we have temporal isolation. So animals breed at different times of the day or the year or the season. You know, a nocturnal animal is never going to be mating with a diurnal animal, one that's um, up at, at night or in the, in the day. Um, maybe they mate in a different time of year or season. You know, so for example, you can see this cute little guy here. The western spotted skunk mates in late summer, while the eastern spotted skunk mates in late winter. So they're never going to mate with each other because one does it in the summer, one does it in the winter. So that would be temporal isolation. Pause here to take notes. Next up, we have behavioral isolation. So these are unique behavioral patterns and rituals for separate species. Um, an example here is one of my favorites. They are blue-footed boobies, and they're only going to mate after a courtship ritual. So that's a behavioral isolation. Um, nope. um, they have to behave in a certain way in order to pass on their, to mate and pass on their genes to their offspring. And if another type of bird doesn't have that same ritual, then the blue-footed booby is not going to mate with them. And here we are again. So that is a behavioral isolation. Pause here to take notes. Next, we have mechanical isolation. It's when the it's when the reproductive anatomy of one species does not fit with the anatomy of another species. So your parts don't fit together. For example, snails have varying spirals on their shells, which prevent mating from happening. So only the right bits can fit into the right bits. That is mechanical isolation. The mechanism of it just doesn't work. Remember, these are prezygotic barriers. So before um, a, um, a fertilization of sperm and egg take place, these things prevent that from ever happening. Next is, I'm sorry, pause here to take notes. <laughs> So next is gametic isolation. So proteins on the surface of sperm do not allow for the egg and the sperm to fuse together. So um, in, in humans, you have the sperm with the acrosome at the top, and it releases those enzymes and eats through the egg to go in and fertilize it. Um, if you don't have those proteins on the surface of your gametes, it's just not going to fuse together and happen. So for example, the sperm and eggs of red and purple sea urchins are released into the water. Right, that's how sea urchins um, mate and, and pass on their genetics, is they will release it into the water, but they can't fertilize each other because they don't have the right gametes. They don't have the right parts. Different than the physical anatomical parts. They don't have the right sperm and egg type. So practice time, morning. 
read each example and determine which type of prezygotic barrier is at work. Are you ready? Number one, many plants have anatomical structures that only allow certain pollinators to collect and distribute pollen. Think about it, write down your answer. If you said mechanical isolation, you are correct. Remember, plants have anatomy too. If the pollinators can't collect it, pollinators, excuse me, can't collect it and distribute it, then they're not passing on their DNA. Lions and tigers are both common in India, but lions live in open grasslands, whereas tigers live in the forest. What kind of isolation, prezygotic isolation is this? Boom, if you said habitat isolation, you are correct. Female fly fireflies identify males of their own species to mate with by flashing patterns. Oh, how interesting. I bet if the female doesn't have a flashing pattern, the male's not going to mate with them. So that would be behavioral isolation. Great job. Okay, let's talk post-zygotic barriers. So this is after the mating has happened. Uh, these are to prevent a uh, hybrid zygote from developing. These types of barriers prevent a hybrid zygote from developing into a viable fertile adult. So we have the sperm, we got the egg, they met each other. Great. These are the things that can go wrong. There's three types. First is reduced hybrid viability. The second is reduced hybrid fertility. And third is called hybrid breakdown. We're going to take these one at a time. Pause here to take notes. So number one, reduced hybrid viability. So the genes of different parent species may interact in ways that impair the hybrid's development or survival, right? So the genes are, are interacting uh, in a way um, that the, the zygote can't survive or develop. So for example, domestic sheep can fertilize domestic goats, but the embryo dies really early on. So it can go through a few stages of mitosis and then it dies. It's never going to become a viable uh, embryo. So this is reduced hybrid viability. Next up, we have reduced hybrid fertility. Now this is a little nuanced because... Um, Evolution it only occurs when you can pass on your genes to the next generation, then they can pass their genes on. So a hybrid can develop into a healthy adult, but is sterile. For example, oh, usually results in differences in the number of chromosomes between parents. So for example, donkeys are made. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it should, unless you get it all screwed up. I don't know. It just has like a little, not a ball. It's like that's going to fall out. No, you're good. So this is one of my favorite examples. So a donkey is a hybrid between a horse and a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a mule is, I'm doing a lecture video right now and recording it for AP Bio. You're good. AP Bio is very concerned about your nose ring staying in. Don't worry about it. All right. So I'm sorry. I'm Sorry about that. Back to this. So a mule. Mules exist. We all know mules exist. Um, a mule is a hybrid between a donkey and a horse, but mules are sterile. So a mule and a mule cannot have babies. So that is reduced hybrid fertility. The genes of the original donkey and horse stop there. They cannot be passed down. So this is what we call reduced hybrid fertility. Lastly, we have hybrid breakdown. So the hybrid of the first generation might be fertile, but when they meet with a parent species or one another, their offspring will be sterile. So for example, we've tried crossbreeding things like cotton plants or other types of organisms, but after the first generation of plants, they don't produce viable seeds. So this is a breakdown of the hybridization of two species. Um, that's it. You got to pass down your DNA. Um, if the organism is sterile, then this would be a post zygotic barrier, um, hybrid breakdown or, um, reduction of, of, uh, hybrid fertility. Okay. So your baby's got to be able to make babies. 
All right, work on that practice free response question. Pause here, then we'll move on. So let's talk a little micro and macro evolution. Speciation is a bridge between these two concepts. Microevolution is a change in allele frequencies within a single species or population. Things that we talked about before in uh, population genetics, things like natural and sexual selection, genetic drift, gene flow, uh, pretty much just passing genes from one group of species to the next, from one population to the next. Macro evolution is these huge evolutionary patterns. So things uh, like a mass extinction or adaptive radiation, which we'll talk about. Um, when there is no change over a long period of time, we say that the species is in stasis. Pause here to take notes. So let's talk about how quickly this happens, this speciation, this forming of new species. Um, so it can occur at different speeds. There's no set, you know, pace for anyone. Um, but we can talk about two different methods here. So one of them is punctuated equilibrium. So this is when evolution occurs rapidly after a long period of stasis. Um, essentially, like a population of species will remain stable, and then something happens, like a bottleneck or some other, like, you know, a natural disaster or a founder's effect, or even like an allopatric speciation will occur. And um, after a long period of time of the species being stable, it'll all of a sudden uh, start developing new adaptations to evolve. The other theory here is called gradualism. And this is when evolution occurs slowly over hundreds, thousands, millions of years. Uh, gradualism is that slow buildup of the mutations. It's throwing spaghetti at a wall to see what sticks. All right. Um, there's a couple different types of evolution. One of them is divergent evolution. So groups with the same common ancestor evolve and accumulate differences resulting in the formation of new species. This is um, an example of gradualism, which by the way, gradualism is how evolution occurs over hundreds of thousands of millions of years when they build up um, this uh, set of mutations. Punctuated equilibrium, you'll see a lot in um, more, less complex organisms like prokaryotes, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, most of the time we accumulate these differences and all of a sudden we have a new species. Um, adaptive radiation is if a new habitat or a niche becomes available, species can diversify. So um, that's sort of the sympatric speciation of there's a, a, a new niche that opens up or a new habitat, for example, um, a new island being formed or a uh, new growth forest or a forest being burnt down, right? There's new niches that are available. The species then diversify. We call that adaptive radiation. And then there's convergent evolution. So this actually does happen as two different species. They develop similar traits despite having different ancestors. If you can recall back to when we spoke about homologous structures among species, that is sort of a um, example of convergent, or I should say a result of convergent evolution. Um, cool. Pause here to take notes. Oh, just kidding. Analogous traits, the homologous structures. I was just saying that. Cool. Thanks. All right. Pause here. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the other side of this, extinction. Extinction is a termination of species. We have had five mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. Human activity has affected extinction rates. We are seeing a huge, 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 um, a, a, an exponential uh, increase in extinctions across the globe. Um, anytime there is any kind of ecological stress, extinction rates can quicken. The ecological stress that our planet is under right now is uh, rapidly rising CO2 rates, thus increasing the global temperature, uh, leading to global extremes. Um, we're looking at another, we're actually living through another mass extinction as we speak. Um, if a species doesn't go extinct, then it opens up a niche that can be exploited by a different species. So, um, I'm sorry, does go extinct. So for example, 
um, white rhinos in Africa. They are on their last leg. When they go extinct, there's going to be another herbivores. There's going to be another species that goes in and takes over the resources that the uh, white African rhino just left behind, right? Because they're not there anymore. Very sad stuff. Not good for the planet. All right, that's it. Sorry for ending on a bummer note, but, you know, we'll talk more about climate action as the time goes on. Thank you so much. I will see you in class tomorrow.